There are so many I wish I'd have known that before I started moments in running that can feel like secrets only known to those already running. But they're not secrets, they're just lessons learned, usually from mistakes made. So let's put you on the fast track and tell you these secrets so you don't have to make the same mistakes as I have. Okay, I can't save you from all of my mistakes, but I can help with some. So here are my nine secrets runners should know, but probably don't. Let's start with something I definitely wish I knew way earlier than I knew it, and it's all to do with hills. So let's say you had a hilly race or a trail race or whatever you've got and everyone says, you know what, you need to get out on the hills. That bit, that bit is true. Because while up is important, I just wish someone would have told me how equally as important being able to run downhill is. The thing is, in a lot of trail races or even hilly road races, you can walk the ups, but even this slow pace controlling the descent is hammering my quads. And that actually can affect your performance way more than the ability to go up them. So the next time you go and do a hill session, remember, attack the down as much as you attack the up. Rest somewhere else, but don't use the down necessarily for recovery because that is a skill in itself. There is a lot of truth in the well-known running adage that you should slow down to get faster. And that's very relevant to all of those newer runners who go in with the belief that you need to run every session hard or even in that grey area between truly easy and hard. So the saying is very relevant in order to make runners understand how to build a solid aerobic base but if you want to get faster then an element of your training needs to actually be fast. It doesn't need to be a lot. For example, Ethiopian runners tend to finish every single session with a tiny bit of speed work, whether that be dedicated strides or just a few seconds to a minute at a higher pace. But there are also always dedicated speed sessions like 400, 800 or kilometer repeats, fartlek sessions, something where you run at least at race pace, if not faster, depending on what you're training for. But the message is clear. To get fast, you do have to run fast sometimes. An important secret I think everyone should know is just how fitness kind of works when you're running, how the gains happen. And the best way I can describe it is that it's on a delay. So let's say I do a good run session today. It's usually three weeks until I'm gonna see any benefit. Now, why is that important? It's important when it comes to how you prepare for your races because there are a lot of athletes that train really hard up to their race thinking I need to stay fit without appreciating that those fitness benefits are not really going to take effect until weeks after. So how is it split? Well, it's pretty easy actually. You get about 16 to 21% training adaptation from 7 to 10 weeks pre-race. Then it starts building a bit at 6 weeks pre-race. The training that you do, there's still 23% adaptation. 5 weeks is 25%. Four weeks, 22%. Three weeks, 12%. So the drop starts to happen and then zero to two weeks before a race, there are 0% training adaptations. So my best advice is now knowing that is that you don't flog yourself in the zero to two weeks before your race. You spend it getting recovered and getting ready for the race rather than pushing yourself to the max all the way up to it because there's no benefit. And I wish people had told me that earlier. There's one great way for beginner runners to get some speed into your sessions. It's not adding individual speed sessions, just at the end of your easy run, you can do some strides. Strides is running faster, focusing on good technique. <laughs> from, 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 for about 200 meters. And you only need to do that about four or five times and you're done. What I don't think newer runners appreciate until they're in the warm embrace of the running nest, I don't even know if that's the correct terminology anyway, is that most experienced runners, not all but most, run in training blocks. So they periodize their training in chunks. And we picked this run purposely because this is the first long run of a block that we're starting to build towards a couple of marathons. So the way it works for us is, and also for most of the athletes that I coach is, three weeks of running work I would call it hard work gradually building week on week and then in that fourth week reduce the volume by 50% and have a recovery week let all those gains actually embed in and it's as simple as that really and you don't have to do the same thing in these blocks that's the beauty of it in some blocks you can work on some speed stuff and focus there and in some blocks like we're doing now you can work on volume and building distance getting you ready for marathons so you can play around. That's the beauty of periodizing that training. 
I love the structure of training blocks. It keeps everything really focused and I'm really driven in those three weeks and then really embrace the recovery week. So it's a great tool to maximize your training. It's nice to have mini end points within a longer end point like a race or a goal. You hear all the cliches, but they're cliches for a reason. So let's start with the most obvious, train smarter, not harder. And it's very true because there is a lot of evidence now out there that is robust, that it's all about the training that you do in terms of the quality more than the quantity. So let's take, for example, tracking your heart rate variability, which is a way of knowing whether you're training ready or not. And you can do it with your watch, you can do it with apps, you can do it with a whoop band, many ways of doing it, but they put two sets of athletes through the same process and they said one set of athletes make sure you listen to the advice that your heart rate variability program gives you and if it says back off back off and if it says don't train don't train other group train on feel train through it if you want to the group that actually listened to the advice made bigger progress on less training than the group that pushed through nonetheless so it is now very much about being smart with your training rather than just throwing distance at the problem. And there are videos on this channel dealing with heart rate variability and how to utilize it best. But the key is listen to your body. Train less, gain more. Something you might not have known is that in running, there is a surface hierarchy. So while we're out on the trails and grass right now, we've been very kind to our joints, but not all runs are the same when it comes to kindness on joints. Probably doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that the hardest on joints is when you're running on road, on pavements, on tarmac, things that don't really give back. But then it might interest you to know what the kind of next few levels are. And the level after road is actually, treadmill has a lot more give than road. Then you get to gravel or shale or shingle or what the Ethiopians call coraconch because of the sound it makes when you're running on it. And then you get down to trail and eventually grass. So routes like these are pretty forgiving, especially in the winter, but this is much kinder on the joints than the road could ever be. So my point in this one is mix up your running. Don't exclusively run on roads, if not just for the sake of your joints. It's actually really interesting to know that Ethiopian top level runners do about 5% of their training on road. Makes you think. How about this for a little bit of rewiring? If you are worrying about the times you should be running your 5K, fear not. The global average 5K time for women is 36.24 and the men is 31.18. So first of all, you might be a little bit faster than you thought you were. But secondly, remember this is just the average of runners and we are a rare breed. So globally, we're probably already in the top five to 10%. So rewire your brain just that little bit and realize it's not about slow or fast, it's about the fact that you're getting out there anyway. But you still might be a little bit faster than you think you are. Let's put it out there, running can make you tired. No point pretending it doesn't. And when you run longer miles, perhaps you're training for a half marathon or marathon, there will be some long runs involved. And when your body and mind get tired is when your normal technique can start to break down. So your body does what it does best and compensates as best it can. Different muscles work in different ways to keep your body moving forwards. But what comes with this is unfamiliar technique and sometimes overuse injuries. And it doesn't take too much of a change. So one way we can combat that technique issue is splitting some of the longer runs into two runs. Let's say you have an hour and a half run. You may be tired and technique would start to falter at about an hour or so. So what if you did two lots of 45 minute runs, one in the morning and one in the evening? You can hold that technique together. Now this shouldn't replace your main long run because you still need that but consider it for those mid-distance easy sessions. And an added bonus is that running produces human growth hormone for muscle growth and repair. So two runs is actually two doses of natural human growth hormone. Plus running twice a day makes you feel like a rock star. Happy days all round. And thanks for watching. Hopefully you learned something new. Oh, oh what this? Oh yeah, it's, it's the new merch. The link is in the description. And if you liked this video, you're definitely gonna like this one, which is the 10 things that runners should do, but probably don't. And I'll see you on Wednesday.